Hi, it's Ian Luckett from Innovate to Success. And in today's episode of the IT Experts Growth Academy podcast, I'm going to be sharing with you the 10 most important things you need to consider while growing your IT and your tech business. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the IT Experts Growth Academy podcast, the only podcast to help ambitious IT and tech business owners increase their sales, profit and productivity. So in today's episode, we're going to be running through with you the ebook that we've got. We're going to put the link in the show notes here, but I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the context and the 10 actionable steps. So this is the image of the book here. And I just want to make sure that you understand that this is not just a little podcast that you're just going to listen to. You need to get a pen and paper as well and probably a cup of coffee as well, whatever your um, whatever your flavor is. Um, and sit down, relax and enjoy this episode because it's going to be full of actions. It's going to be full of examples and things that you need to know to help you grow your IT and your tech business. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, you know, how's your business going? How do you understand whether or not your business is performing? And what I mean by this is most of you um, IT and tech business owners are consumed and are absolutely brilliant technical people and you love doing the technical element of the work. That's why you're doing what you're doing. That's why you've got the businesses that you've got. Now, the thing we need to work on is while you're working in the business and you're delivering excellent customer service, you're delivering your quotations, et cetera, et cetera, to your clients, There's a whole sales and marketing, finance, managing people, dealing with the business development side of things that you need a bit of a hand with. And this book is going to address those issues. It's going to help you understand the little fundamental building blocks, what you need to do, how you need to do it. And as I said before, after every single step, we've got an, an action point for you so that you can walk away from listening to this podcast watching this podcast whatever your um, you know whatever's best for you um, with a plan on how you're going to grow your IT and your tech business some of the things that you're going to hear are you've already doing and some of the things are going to be brand new and that's what we're here to do at the IT experts growth academy is to help you build confidence so that you can increase your leads you can increase your profit and you can make your business a nicer place to work so essentially we've got a five step model here at innovate to success it's called the drive for business model if you go back to episode 1 it goes through the 25 key steps that we're using to help IT business owners get great results right now and I'm not going to go through the details of it now but it's a model that's been tried and tested and it helps you understand quite simply personal development or your vision business development where you're leads your sales and your marketing is coming from, your people planning, where you're scaling your business, who are you involving in your organisation, finance and commercial, understanding your packages, your money coming in, your money going out, and then also measuring your business. You know, what gets measured gets done. So that's the model. That's how we've constructed this ebook here. Now let's just dive into the detail. But if you want to know more about the IT experts drive for business model, then click on the link on the show notes. It will take you to the website where there's an absolute rake of content under each section. If you're having people problems, you go to the people planning section. If you need to know a little bit more about how to measure your business, you go to the business performance and there's loads of content on there that will help you do that. So that's all content based on here, but let's get that back to the ebook into step one. So step one is all about why are you actually growing your IT business. What is it you want to do? Now, there's a couple of things here. Number one, you might actually inherited the business. You might have grown up through it. You might have started as an apprentice and now you're a shareholder and you're an owner of the business. You might have bought it and you might want to take it to uh, to a new level. You have could have different products and services than that were originally in the organization itself. But the key thing is to understand why you want to grow your business. Now, A couple of things here is is that we need to understand and we need to make sure that, you know, your personal life and your business life are obviously two, you know, two different different parts of your different parts of your life. But the business life pays for lots of things that go on in your personal life. But we need to have that work life balance. There's no point working, you know, 100, 120 hours a week flogging over a, uh, you know, over an organization and then never seeing your wife and your kids or getting time to chill out and relax. You know, all of our brains need time to relax from one time to another. So we need to understand what it is we're trying to do and understand what that actual purpose of growing our organizations is. And once you have that vision, once you have that idea on what the business is going to look like in three to five years' time, 
then you can share that with other people that you've got within your organization. And then they can help you grow because they'll be supporting the overall achievement of the business. And then once we have that vision, once we understand what one, three, and five years looks like in your organization, then you can share that with other people in your organization, with your stakeholders, with your employees, with other contractors that you've got. And then they will all help you because they'll be aligned with the vision of the business, the mission of the business, what you're trying to achieve, how you're trying to achieve it, and then also the values of the organization as well. So it's really important that we get these things really crystallized in the owner's mind. I was with a client a little while ago and he wanted to double the size of his organization. Now, this is where we need to be a bit careful when we're talking about business growth because yes, we're in a technical niche here. We need to understand how the organization cost structure works, but also we need to make sure that we're really, really clear on how it's actually performing. So he wanted to double the size of his organization, but as soon as we started diving into the numbers, it was really clear that he got a whole load of costs there that he just didn't need. Subscriptions, and there was a there were some subscriptions, there were some memberships, and there were some other direct debits going out. They've been going out for years before he was an owner of the business, but they didn't serve any value in terms of generating any revenue. So we actually managed to almost get his, his target of, of doubling his business in terms of his profit by just stripping out a whole load of costs. So there was another client of mine who was just busy being busy. And when I actually said, well, what are you, what are you focusing on? What revenue generating tasks are you focusing on the problem was is that he couldn't delegate to his staff because he didn't trust them so what we ended up doing was we ended up putting together a performance management framework so he could then delegate to his staff he could then focus on revenue generating tasks and all of the good things that he needs to do and focus on all of those good things so that then he could leverage his time and get other people to help him grow his business okay it's time for the action then point one get your piece of paper out and a pen and write down really really vividly why did you start your business? Why are you in the position that you're in? What is it that you're actually trying to achieve? And what I mean by this is I want to know, you know, what are some of the key points? What do you want to get out of growing your business? What does winning look like to you? What does, you know, when you have won, when you've grown your business, what does that feel like? And be really, really vivid, but get that down under action one. Okay, so step two is about defining your business purpose. So we've just covered off in step one all about you and what you want to try and achieve from your organization. But now I want to talk about what is it your business actually does. And this is where you start to work into kind of some of the USP, the unique selling proposition, and what it is you're doing within your organization to help your clients. So one of the things I always hear people say is, oh, I'm really good at um, customer service, or I'm really nice, at, you know, we're really good at and friendly and all of those sort of things. People don't buy a friendly company. People don't buy good customer service. They want to know exactly what you're going to provide for them. So is it going to be a secure network? Is it going to be easy access if things go wrong? Is it going to be, um, you know, making sure that when there's a project going on on side, that natural fact you're going to go in there, deliver the project on time, on budget, get in, get out make sure that they you know they get their uh, business back up and running again with a great infrastructure so we need to understand why people are buying from you and that helps you define your business purpose and within your business purpose understanding that usp that we just spoke about is really really critical now what do we mean about by usp why do people buy from you is it because you've got a simple product, service, and solution? Is it because you've got a model that you take them through to help them with their cybersecurity or their software problems? Are you particularly you know, specialist in dealing with hotels, for example, dealing with their infrastructure? Or it might be in the finance sector, or it could be in the legal sector. If you are niching into an area, which is scary, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but if you're niching into an area, you will become an expert in that field. And then when somebody needs their IT services resolving, they'll go to the person that deals with solicitors or deals with builders or deals with banks or whatever particular niche that might be. So niching is scary because you think, well, what about all the other people that I can help? Can't I help all those? Well, of course you can. You can help wherever you need. But in terms of your marketing, your message must get really, really clear. It must get really clear to the heart of your prospects so that they understand very, very succinctly why you're the best person to help them out. And if that doesn't come out in your marketing message, then you will your leads will dry up and your business will dry up as well. So it's really important that we understand what that looks like and why people are buying from you. And that's your business purpose. Okay, so let's talk about niching for a minute. Very, very often I get a company come towards me and say, how can you help me grow my business? And normally the biggest problem that they have is that they haven't niched. Now, 
what we mean by niching is, is that focusing into a, a particular target market, it could be location, it could be sector, it could be size of company, it could be type of company. Um, and the important thing here is, is that you generate a, um, you know, an environment, whether it be through social media, through your website, through your marketing, where you position yourself as the expert because you're getting more and more experience in how to grow, for example, me, an IT and a tech business. Now, essentially, I could help any business grow. And it's not really too much of an issue for me because I've got the fundamentals and I've got the model and I can adapt that model, the drive for business model to other organisations. And I do that. People come to me and say, can you help me grow my business? And it'll be, yeah. And it might be a manufacturing organisation. Now, I'm not targeting manufacturing organisations, but I apply the same model, which means that although that your niche could be, and I'll pick legal for an example, um, you could also deal with, you know, um, healthcare you could also deal with hotels or event spaces or uh, other things like that but the important thing is is that when you're outreaching through your marketing that your messaging and that your experience comes out in that message on your website in your LinkedIn profile whatever it might be and the target market sees that they might see a piece of content they might see a video a blog they might see your website through PPC or SEO and they'll know that you are talking to them specifically about the problems that they might have. That is really important and that is kind of like the number one thing that I end up having to help people with uh, a majority of my week, to be quite honest with you. So the action on this one is actually quite a large one and I want you to get your piece of paper out and I want you to understand what your business purpose is. You know, who is it that you're helping? What are the values? What is your vision? What is the mission for the organization? You know, what products and services do you provide? If somebody said to you, walked in the door and they said, what do you do and who do you help? You've got one piece of paper and on that piece of paper, you've got all that information there down. And that is your business purpose and that is the main reason that your organization is living. Okay, under step three, we talk about who you are actually helping in your organization. This is the individual. Now, we did touch on niche in a little while ago in, in, in the last step, but now I want to look at what does that actually mean for your business. So if you are, for again, if for example, if you're in the legal profession, what the prospects and what the clients are going to be really looking for is they're going to be looking for what are the specific things that you do that help me understand that you're the one to fix my IT problems. So if we take the legal and you know legal or financial areas, you will understand about banking halls. You'll understand that the banking hall is a really important part of their organization. You need to make sure that the IT is up and running. You need to make sure that there's backups. You need to make sure that it's safe and it's not been hacked. You need to make sure that there's certain hours during operation where your SLAs might be more important and shorter than others because of a direct you know, need for your services if something fails. And that's what they're going to want to know. So it's all very well and good picking a niche and saying, yes, I'm the great guy. I'm going to be looking after your, you know, IT in this space. But you need to understand what their pain points are. When you've got their pain points and you've got those listed down, it might be, we'll take resilience of service, for example. In your marketing, you need to make sure that you've got, you know, we make sure that your network is up 24-7, 365. As soon as you start getting matches and as soon as you start matching their pain points with your services and your solutions, then you start getting closer together. Then you start building rapport and you've got much more likeliness of actually being able to close the sale itself. Another part about understanding who your ideal customer is and who you're actually serving is to dig deep with high quality questions. And what I mean by this is that when they turn around to you and they sort of say, oh, we're fed up with our last IT company. What was it about that IT company you didn't like? And they might turn around and say, well, they never returned our phone calls. Okay. And what was the impact of them never returning our phone calls? Well, the impact of never returning our phone calls meant that we actually lost some business because the server went down and the, you know, the whole network went down. And for example, you know, we then lost you know, some sales that we were currently doing. So the actual impact of not responding was actually lost sales. So we can then start working around in terms of the sales process and the prospecting and the asking high quality questions. It's around losing money. It is around the IT company. But we, what we need to try and do is we need to try and link all the way through and ask the high quality questions and get to the root of the problem. Once you've got to that root of the problem, go back into your marketing, go back into your business purpose, the reason that you're doing what you're doing and make sure that's really, really clear 
when it comes out. So for example, with me, I could walk into a room and I could grow any business. We said that before. But what we're doing right here is that we're helping the IT and the tech because I understand that you guys think a different way. I understand that you're normally the technical people in the organization and you don't understand about sales and marketing and all of these kind of good things. Don't understand about packaging, proposal, how to sell something. Now, once I've come across and said, look, your number one problem is you want to increase those leads, but that's not really your problem. Your problem is, is that it's not profitable because you're spreading around. You haven't probably got a standardized systemization for selling your products and services, let alone proposing them. But then also you're running around because you're not trusting people. So you actually want to get a more efficient business and you need to manage your systems and your processes. So quite simply, I help IT and tech business owners increase their leads, increase their profit and make their business a nicer and a more efficient place to work. How clear is that? So action number three, get your paper out again. And I want you to have a really good think about who your ideal customer avatar is you know who are they who's the one in the organization that buys you might have you know car dealerships for example but who is the person who's buying is it the facilities manager is it the IT manager why do they buy from you what kind of budget do they have how are you going to build that rapport what is your plan to go and demonstrate to them that you are the person that's going to fix their problem what is your plan to make sure that you can help them and how are you going to get that message across so it's really really clear that you're the expert you're going to fix their problems and they come and buy from you rather than you having to go out and sell to them. Okay, step four, we're now talking about connecting with your clients. And what I mean, I don't mean give them a call or give them a message on email or LinkedIn or something like that. What I want you to do here, and what's really important here is you really understand your client's business. You really understand what they're trying to achieve, what their growth plan is, how many people they've got in their organization, how that affects the product services and solutions that you're providing, and really, you know, just phoning them up and having a chat, building rapport, building their relationships. Because the more and more you know about your client, their business and their own growth plans, then the better chance you've actually got of being able to be intrinsic in that organisation and helping them to understand and shape the future. So, for example, there was one client I was working with and he said, I just popped into this particular shop and they said to me, yeah, we're going to, um, we're um, you know, coming for a coffee. And he went in there, had a chat and a coffee with him and he could see there was some building work going on. He said, what, what's going on over there? I said, oh, we're expanding the office out. Okay. Um, what, um, you know, do you need some more computers? Do you need some more? Yeah. Oh, in actual fact, yeah. He ended up doing a quote for them and ended up, I think it was about 15 or 20 new computers. But if he hadn't been there having a catch up and a coffee and seeing how his client was and what challenges they currently got, then he wouldn't actually have been in that position where they were saying, yeah, you know, let me understand your, you know, what's going on in your business right now so I can help you further. The other thing as well, from a technical point of view, is that when you actually understand what your client are doing, you, you're learning all the time. You're a technical sponge, right? And you're learning all the time. And you've got all this new technology going on with regards to backups, with regards to new servers, new networks, Wi-Fi, connectivity, all of these types of things going on. If you don't know what your client's doing in their own business, how can you serve them even better and add more value? As I said in the last um, point, we want people to buy from you. We don't want you to go and sell to them. If you go and sell to them, then you're in a price comparison site and you might as well go on to go compare. And that is not a great place to be for any business. And this is where niching and becoming a speciality is in the right place. And as the example came up on the, and the example on the sheet, I was talking to one of my clients and she was saying that she literally did just phone up one of her clients and said, you know, how's it going? Tell me about what challenges you've got right now. There weren't, they were kind of selling individual, um, like individual projects as it would be. So it wasn't an ongoing recurring income, but it was, tell me about what's going on and, and what's happening in your business. And then all of a sudden, she's come out of there with seven and a half thousand pounds, seven or eight thousand pounds worth of orders that she didn't have before because she's literally just ringing up, putting her face out there, letting them know that you're still about and letting them understand what you're doing in the organization. And then you're, she was then, you know, because of that, she was in the right place at the right time. But if you're not in the right place, you're never going to be in the right place at the right time. OK, so your action on step four is to make a note of all of your key clients. 
schedule it out and make a phone call with them. But the more important thing, when you're actually making that phone call, rather than just ringing them up and going, ah, oh, hi there, it's Ian, I'm just checking out to see how business is going. Refer back to the last conversation you had. You might have had a problem with a server. You might have had a, an issue with a proposal. There could be all sorts of different things. Ask them specifically, how are you getting on with that new Cisco server? How is that new backup system from Datto coming on? You know, and ask them something meaningful rather than ringing up for a catch up and kind of touching everyone's bases. No one really wants to do that. It needs to be purposeful. You need to be purposeful, you know, and persistent and making sure that you schedule out your time to reconnect with your clients, find out what they want, and more importantly, find out how you can serve them more. This is going to help you generate more leads. This is going to help you generate more business. And in turn, it's going to help you generate more referrals. Okay, step five is all about knowing your numbers. Now, we don't need accountants to get involved in this. We don't need a whole rake of spreadsheets. But what we do need to do is we need to have a clear understanding on how our organizations operate from a health point of view. I always describe it as, you know, do you know what levers you need to push to get more leads in and do you know what levers you need to pull back the other way to actually reduce some of the costs now cash is king without cash we all kind of die effectively in a commercial world but understanding what levers we've got to, to, to push and pull to generate that additional income and to reduce those costs is absolutely critical for any business now cash flow is one way we do this with a cash flow schedule we understand what cash we've got coming in and that's kind of a good way to look at the health of the business also I find actually ripping through your monthly transactions in your bank statement is always a good way to have a look at well what is going on always try and match off all of your costs with a revenue generating task if you put this into a proper spreadsheet then what you'll soon be able to see from a monthly point of view is kind of like your profit and loss per month you could have recurring revenue going on you could have project work going on but you need to know that what the health of that business is looking like what the health of your business is looking like from a commercial point of view if you don't know that and you don't understand really how healthy your business is and it's not your bank balance that's the health of your business because there's other risks there's other accruals and costs that haven't been attributed yet and we need to really get to grips with knowing our numbers one of the things we look at in terms of productivity around the commercial productivity is about revenue generating tasks so when you look at your, your your tasks that you're carrying out in a day or the rest of your team are carrying out in a day which ones are directly generating revenue and which ones are incurring costs so you are going to have business development costs you know i get that you're going to have you know your own website your own marketing and all of those kind of other things there but you need to measure you need to understand how you're measuring those things you need to understand what value they're bringing back in your organization and for the really ambitious among if you get to get to the point where you know the cost per lead cost for conversion and understand your lead generation process from a commercial point of view under business development as well then that's a really great place to be firing on all cylinders the example that we've got on the page here and under step five of the ebook is a really really typical one where IT and tech business owners are fixated, I don't know why, but they're fixated with having an hourly rate in their brain. And the hourly rate is one of the worst things in terms of a comparison because you can sit there and you can compare yourself, might be, I don't know, £75 an hour, could be £90 an hour, £100 an hour. But we want to get away from all of that. We don't want anything to do with hourly rate cost. What we need to do is we need to get the proposal, we need to get your methodology and your packaging and your services into a point where you're providing the client with benefits you're providing them with deliverables and outcomes so that they can then see what they're actually getting so when we spoke a little bit earlier on about the journey that you were going through in the questioning when we get to the bottom if we remember back to that question we were talking about where we lost some we lost some sales how many sales did you lose well it was about ten thousand pounds brilliant because our service for the whole year is about seven and a half thousand pounds. So if we save that from happening once, you're two and a half thousand pound up. That's the way we need to start thinking a bit more commercially. Get our way from the hourly rate. All pricing, let's get this out there right now. All pricing is made up. Every single bit of pricing is made up. It's about the value that you bring to an organization and it's about the value that you provide to your client. But you've got to demonstrate it before they'll test you out and then they'll buy from you. Once you've got a whole rake of clients that are buying from you and they're delighted and they're passing referrals, it gets a lot easier and then your business is going to start to snowball. Okay, action on number five here is really, really simple. I want to take your top five clients and I want to take your top 
five costs and I want you to look at your top five clients and I want you to work out how you can end up generating more sales from those clients themselves and then with your top five costs I want you to look at what on earth are they are they generating revenue are they helping you to generate revenue and what can you do to reduce down I actually foam up my gas electric and water uh, and the internet I think every year and threaten to cancel to renegotiate because they've always got a better deal people will do that with you so you do that with your costs. If you can lower your costs and you can increase your sales, the bit in the middle is all yours and that's that lovely profit that we keep talking about. So understanding and knowing your numbers, get that down on your action sheet there. Try and understand how you can get better value for your clients so you can potentially charge them more and also reduce your costs as well. Okay, so step six is all about planning out your people. Now, there are some frightening statistics out there about the amount of people in an organization in the tech world who are out of work and it's about half a percent which to me means there's a load of people out there that are crap because they're not providing the service they're not providing the right technical ability. and everybody's got someone in their organization i don't care who you are everyone's got them in someone in their organization who is not pulling their weight now Millennials are one thing, and I'm not going to cast aspersions over millennials, but if you're like me and you're kind of in your mid to late 40s, you've got a very, very different look at the world than you have if you're 20 and if you're, you know, if, if you're bringing up apprentices. Now, it's very hard to bring in somebody who's experienced, who could be in their mid 30s, early 40s, something like that, who's got a wealth of experience because number one, they're going to be very expensive and they're probably going to be mainly a contractor as well. So one of the easiest things to do is to bring in an apprentice and to then bring up and to develop them and grow your own effectively. But before you do that, you need to understand what structure you've got in place, how they fit within the organization, what training you're going to give them, because you want them to stay for a long time. You're going to invest a rake of money in them, trying to get them developed and go through college and understand exactly what they're doing, and then you're going to let them loose on your clients. And the really important thing here is, is that you understand, you give them accountability, you make them, you make them responsible for things, but you've got to have a process in place for you to do that. And that could be an appraisal system. Um, also, you need to understand that if you've got people outside your organisation who are contractors and you know other people, um, you know externals as it would be, then we understand how we're measuring those as well. And what is that expectation exchange? What I mean by an expectation exchange is I'm going to give you some money, you're going to come to work, and hey, guess what? We're going to do some great work together. But I want you to deliver this. Otherwise, I'm not going to be giving you the money. So we need to have some grown up conversations around holding people to account, making them, you know, having difficult conversations with people and making them deliver for us, because that's essentially why we're employing them to start with. So one particular client came to me and they, he'd got a guy who'd come up and he'd, he'd come up and he was working with him and he'd, been, he'd inherited this organisation. And um, this guy would just not even turn up for work early. He, was, he wasn't even turning up for work on time in actual fact. He was turning up late. He was a mess. He, wasn't, he couldn't put him in front of clients or anything like that. So what we did, we sat him down and we said to him, right, this is what we want you to achieve. This is the business purpose. We talked about it in steps one, two, and three. This is who we serve. This is why we serve it. And this is how you're going to fit into that plan. This is what we want you to do. This is what we want you to take accountability for. This is how we're going to measure you. Oh, and by the way, when you do all of these things, guess what's going to happen? We're going to reward you. All of a sudden, this guy flicked around pretty much on a sixpence. And all of a sudden, he's now engaged he's coming in on time he's got purpose he's got a bit of a spring in his step okay we haven't turned him into mary poppins or anything like that but he was absolutely just a changed person because we'd spent the time sitting down going through the appraisal system and helping him understand exactly where he fit in the organization how he's helping us and then how we can help him in return really great result there okay so the action here on step six is to draw out your organization's chart Draw out who's at the top, you know, where you've kind of fit in, then your senior guys, and then who's reporting into who. Now, it might not be a very big organisation chart, but the most important things, when you're on holiday or you're out doing some business development or if you're, you know, off doing other things, then you need to know who's accountable for what particular task within that within your organisation. So you could have somebody's accountable for the help desk, you could have somebody's in account of projects and service delivery, you could have somebody who's in, in charge of you know tech support and going out there and, and helping the clients, you know, from a physical point of view. Now, once you've done that, 
look at the individual people and look at who we need to help them develop, who do we need to coach, who do we need support, who needs extra training so that we can then upskill them. Because at the end of the day, people generally leave their manager, they don't leave an organisation. If you're not coaching and developing and supporting your staff and spending time on your people planning, then people will leave you and it's going to cost you a rake of money to bring more people back in. So just spend some time. Believe me, this absolutely works. I've been doing this for over 20 years in corporate and also, you know, recently with the with the IT and tech guys is just spend a little bit of time, work your plan through understand what each individual person needs we get them engaged communicate with them and you're gonna have a great team that's gonna help you take your business to the next level okay step seven is about being accessible now what do we mean by being accessible what it means is when your client wants to get hold of you make sure you're there now the funny thing with this is that with all the tech that we've got going on with all the chat bots with all the answering systems with all the virtual PAs and all the other people we've got around the world who are helping us communicate and helping us understand what we're trying to do is we need to make sure that we've still got that personal touch. You've gone all the way through this sales pipeline. You've gone all the way through building rapport. What are you going to do? Ignore them when, when they give you the work. So we need to make sure that you're accessible. You need to have, again, a little bit of an expectation exchange that if you've got a service level agreement that says an hour, then obviously get back to them you know, within the hour. Don't leave it, you'd obviously, two or three hours because you'll be out of your, out of your SLA. But if they phone you and expecting to be an hour, don't jump to them and all of a sudden disrupt what you're doing. Have your plan for your day. Understand what you're trying to achieve on your week, you know, on your day, on your week, on your month. And work interruptions around that. So clients will be great at interrupting. They will phone you up and they'll expect because you're the number one guy who's going to help all their IT businesses, uh, IT issues. They think, great, I can phone him and he's going to help me straight out. Now, that's great and you can do that, but you've got to manage that. Otherwise, you'll get interrupted, you'll get in overwhelm and you'll end up probably end up spending more time with your needy clients when you don't actually need to. Um, and in actual fact, you could be passing that down to responsibility to other people in your team who can then help you as well. So that's another thing we need to consider, you know, in being accessible. And an analogy I use quite a lot of the time is, is that like the latest influx of all the Metro banks. And I think this is a phenomenal thing. But Metro Bank, the one that I bank in, it's actually got a drive through. It's got an outside bank teller and it's got a drive through cash machine. So I don't even have to get out of my out of my car to go to the bank. How accessible is that? Now, the reason that I bank with them is because I can't be bothered to go to, I mean, most, most of the banking, I suppose, these days is all online, but I can't be bothered to go into the town, queue up, get caught up in a lot of traffic, walk around the town, go to the bank. I want to go somewhere I can literally just go in there, drop some money off or go and talk to them about a problem I've got with the account. And that is a great way of being accessible. So what we need to do under this action point is we need to think about how we are accessible, how we're providing services. You know, is it through your help desk, through a ticketing system? But are you monitoring that? Are you making sure that you're achieving those, you know, those, those SLAs and we're getting back to people? Do you hold a customer service, you know, kind of a courtesy call once a month? And this does go back to kind of a bit of an onboarding process. So we spoke earlier on about an expectation exchange and what they would expect when the phone rings. Get that set out in your onboarding process. Make sure your onboarding is absolutely you know, clear and they know exactly what they're going to be ex expecting here. And in addition, in this action here, have a look at the systems that you've got and have a look at how reliable I are and do you have any problems with them? So do your clients complain about things? When they moan and they complain, it's normally because something doesn't meet their expectations. Have a think under the you know under this being accessible at how you're gonna solve those problems and how you're gonna help them become more accessible. And do you know what you could do? You could just ask them the question, how is it you'd like to be contacted? How do you wanna contact us? Do you know, just at the end of the day, business is about relationships. So let's just talk to them and understand. But don't let this be a blocker because this will be one thing we spoke about earlier. Why do you want to change your IT support company? Why do you want to change this particular you know, tech business? Because I can't get hold of them and they don't respond to me. So don't let that be one of your things. Okay, now it's time to work your plan. And what I mean by that is planning by many people is perceived as really, really boring and oh my God, I can't be bothered to do this. But the most important thing here is, is that you've actually got a plan of what you want to achieve. Now, whether that be in Excel, whether that be on Microsoft Planner, whether that be in Project, whatever it might be, where you've got strategic tasks you need to complete, 
You need to make sure that you've got them written down, you know that what the deliverables are, the time scales, and you've got accountable people to making sure that you can do, you know, you, you, you can achieve those goals. Now, the thing with planning is, is it, get, it helps you kind of stay out of stress, but it helps you also manage stress. And what I mean by that is, is that if all of a sudden you've got a big influx of a big customer issue that you've got to deal with, you can put your plan to one side, deal with the issue, and then you can come back in a focused manner and pick your plan up where you left off. If you haven't got a plan, then you're just going to be looking at the things that's going to make you feel good to get to the end of the day and then you wake up in the morning and then you've forgotten all these things and it's really important. So as a business leader, having a strategic plan and kind of having a working plan and what processes and, and processes and systems you're dealing with is really essential because, as I say, it helps you keep on track, but it also helps you manage those interruptions in your day as well. And one of the analogies I want to use here today is about the different levels of you know depth of planning now you know the story that i use quite a lot of the time is about an airline airline pilot he takes off from heathrow he's going to new york and he takes off from heathrow and guess what as he's going over cornwall he's not interested in the airport in new york he's more interested in what's going on right now yes the overall objective is to move from one side of the atlantic ocean to the other but as he gets nearer and nearer and he starts to see the coast, he then starts his descent and he's going down. And then he sees the airport and he starts going down at a different level. And then he makes his landing and he taxis up towards the terminal. Business planning is no different than that. You start with your high level plan. This is what we want to achieve in one, three and five years time. Then we go down to what do we need to achieve quarterly? What do we need to achieve monthly? Break it down to individual persons, you know, with regards to their accountability and making sure that they understand what they're doing, what the level of service is and getting that together. This is about delegating. This is about having structured delegating. And if you've ever been in an organisation where people have said, well, we just don't have a plan, we just kind of get on with it. And when the client rings, we, we deal with it. That's the most unorganised way and the most inefficient way to run a business. So the other thing when you do have a plan is you can break the smaller sections of that plan and you can pass it down and you can then delegate to individual people so they can start learning, being empowered, feel a bit more wanted in the organisation. And then when they've actually got those areas and when they've got those sections, they're going to feel more motivated and they're going to feel they're going to want to come in and achieve their individual little goals themselves. The best bit, if you structure this correctly, everyone in the organisation swims and sings from the same hymn sheet. And then that's when your business growth starts to take off because you've got more people helping you rather than you running around working 100 hours a week. Okay, so the action here is to take a relatively complex plan or project that you're working on right now, and I want you to start breaking it down. I want you to start testing out and breaking down how you're actually achieving that, that task. And if you're the one doing all the steps, or there's a couple, two or three of you doing all the steps, then we need to start looking at how we're gonna stop doing that and how we're gonna start to delegate to people and start to delegate out and empower other people to do you know, different parts of the task. If you've already done it and do it on an old project, you could do a lessons learned on a project, for example, but then when you've got a new project, you can use the same model again. Planning is so important. Planning is absolutely key to any business growth success, and you must make sure that you've got a resilient plan and you update it and you track your progress. Because again, as I said before, what gets measured gets done. So step nine is all about your business on one page. Now, I vowed actually to manage up to about four million pound business on one page in terms of a KPI dashboard. And what we mean by that is your key performance indicators. What are the things that you're measuring in your business right now? What are the things that are critical to your success? Again, I'm going to go back to the one and the three year plan to achieve your goal this year. And it might be, say, for example, it's to hit a million this year. A uh, million pound turnover this year. What are the things? How many clients do you need to do to, to you know to to sell to to serve to do that? How many projects do you need to do? How many? What's the average price of each client? How much do they cost to procure? How much do they cost to serve? And understanding all of those good things, even down to your sales performance and your sales process. What happens when you start to put a, a KPI dashboard together, which is generally a monthly document, a scorecard will be a weekly document where you can keep track of your individual sales teams and the service delivery, but understanding where the business is going on a monthly basis, and then start to get it into a three month rolling program. Reason being is that it's hard to make big changes in a month, 
but three months is a little bit more manageable and you can start to understand how the business is, is feeling and the strategies that you're using around your lead gen, your marketing, your sales process, your service delivery and all of these good things in a bit of a longer term scale. So having a KPI dashboard is critical. Building it up yourself with your key performance indicators and the key things that makes your business tick is the first step to doing just that. And measuring your business is absolutely personal to you. So by now, you know, we're at step nine of 10 of how to grow your IT and your tech business. You're gonna know much, much more about your customers, who they are, where they are, what you're doing, your people, how you're gonna measure it, your products, your services, and your solutions, and all of these good things. So start to bring in these themes into, you know, your, your thoughts on how you're gonna build your KPI dashboard up. Now, I used to work for multi-million pound businesses in London, and we used to spend hours and hours and probably days actually on a monthly basis putting together a big wad of a report a rainbow report all colors and charts and all sorts of things all on for a monthly report into the directors and they never ever read it all they ever read was the front page they just want to know what the dashboard's right so while i was going out there you know now started starting my own consultancy some three or four years ago now putting this together and understanding the importance of those kpi dashboards and understand the importance of those reports why am I going to suggest to you that you go and do an inch thicker paper when in actual fact you only want to know the front page, which is your dashboard itself? So you can put some charts on it, you can put some graphs on it, you can put them around the office. And this is where we then build this back into your appraisal system, your bonus system, your people plan. So you're then motivating people with their own goals and they can see the progress as they're moving forwards in the business and in the organisation. The only thing you need to be a little bit careful about, if you're putting dashboards up around the walls and it's got financial information, on it and you do have clients coming in your office then you just need to be a bit careful that you don't divulge those sorts of things out to the wider wider people so your action on step nine is really simple get your piece of paper out get your a4 piece of paper and your pen out and let's start to work out what would the kpi dashboard actually look like for you number of clients average spend per client monthly average average revenue you know new clients onboarded how many people we've got in the pipeline size of the pipeline costs you know, direct debits or, or subscriptions and those sorts of things. Start to think about what they're actually going to be looking like on your dashboard. Then assign accountability and make sure one person, go back to your plan, go back to have a look at your, your structure again on the people that we've got on there. Go back to that plan, have a look and see, and make those people accountable for delivering those results. And then what we can do is we can then say, now we've got the, the task, now we've got the individual, and now we've actually got the section where you're, you're working and you're helping motivate someone to increase those figures. All of a sudden, you're not doing it all on your own. You've got a great big you know team of people that are all structured, they're all measured, they know exactly what they're doing, and they're helping the business grow, becoming more, more efficient because you're measuring the business all in one place. Okay, we are at step 10. Well done. Thank you very much for sticking with me all the way through this. And this section of the book is called Rinse, Review and Repeat. And pretty much it is what it says on the tin. We've done a month now. We've got your business purpose, your values and your vision. We've got everything all organized. We've had your KPI dashboard at the end of the report. And now what we need to do is we now start need to start analyzing the reports. We need to start analyzing where you've got trends. Now, the thing with the monthly um, report, monthly dashboard, is, is that some of your costs might, sit, might not sit aligned within those particular months, which is why the three month, the quarterly review is the most important because that gives you your whole quarter. You can put in costs that might sway over uh, different areas of the months. And it helps people relax a little bit and not panic if after someone's been on holiday for a couple of weeks in a month, it starts to do, uh, you know, cause a, a bit of an issue in that area. So what we need to do is we need to have a look at the performance. We need to review the performance section by section. We need to then understand whether that's good, bad, on plan or not. And then we need to address it in terms of a focused, you know, whether it be a focused meeting or a workshop, if the performance isn't where it needs to be. But the most important thing is you're now starting to measure the meet, measure your business. You're now starting to understand what's going well, what's not going well, and more importantly, who's doing what about it. One of the best things to do right now is to set out 
a meeting pulse. And what I mean by that is you've got your quarterly review every three months. You'll have a monthly meeting where you sit down and you review the performance and you review the dashboard. But you'll also have like a weekly scorecard meeting or a weekly kind of catch up to make sure that you're understanding what's going on. It's a client I was talking to yesterday from Mastermind and he'd actually got himself having a, one, a Monday, Wednesday and a Friday meeting. What went on last week? How are we getting on this week? What's the plan for next week? And you can use all sorts of different configurations of meetings, different lengths. Most meetings, in actual fact, need to be a lot shorter than they than they are in reality. But making sure that you've got that meeting pulse is really important. The reason it's important because people who are operating your system and your process, which is your business growth system that we've just been talking about for the last 30, 40 minutes, are now understanding how they feel into it and how they can contribute you know, towards the success of the organization. And they will start feeding back to you and they'll start telling you what's going well, what's not going well. Now, when I was working in corporate, everyone used to go, oh, you only have to review your, review your targets every quarter. Now, that's not enough. That is just not enough. You need to do it a minimum monthly. And the minimum monthly also goes in terms of your communication with your teams. So when you set up your appraisal systems and you set up their targets, make sure you're reviewing them once a month as well. Look at the overall view of the organization. Look at the, you know, the sales, the marketing, but the people operating these processes are the really important people because they're going to be the ones that are going to help you take your business to the next level. And they're the ones that are going to help you understand when things don't go right because they're gonna help you fix it. So your final action on the book, action on number 10, is all about making sure you set that meeting pulse, making sure that you set, now book a meeting in your diary. One of my best top time management tips is to book a meeting in your diary when you're gonna sit down and review your dashboard, when you're gonna sit down and talk to your people, when you're gonna sit down and you're gonna review particular parts of the organization. Schedule out six months in one go. Put it in your Outlook, invite everybody so once it's there you're the one now who now needs to take the business forward because you're the one who's setting the pulse of when we're going to be talking about particular parts of the business performance so look at who's the accountable people what area they're going to be responsible for when are they going to give you that data when is that you know is, is that going to be important now a lot of this you might think Do you know what this is a bit of an overkill but it's not because you only need to do one thing at a time you know how do you eat an elephant in bite-sized chunks? We do small pieces bit by bit. So just by starting to measure and starting to talk to your people on a monthly basis about business performance and how things are going and how things are not going so well will get you well ahead of your competition. So that's the end of the how to grow your IT and tech business in 10 steps. I urge you to go back and listen to this podcast you know, over again and listen and make sure that you understand exactly what it is that we're saying and what we're suggesting and how the system works. At the end of the day, we need to build a system, an operating system for your organization so that it will help you to scale, it will help you to pedal faster, it will help you to change direction and add different products and services and solutions as your business grows. As always, if there's anything that you need any support or help with, click into the show notes and there'll be a contact box. We've got the IT Experts Growth Academy over on LinkedIn where we put premium content in there to help you grow your IT and your tech business. I hope this has been of use. If you've enjoyed the audio, if you enjoyed the video, then as I said before, click on the link and then there's also the um, the ebook version as well, which will help you and maybe you can put it on your desk and then tick off some things when you achieve them as well. So that's about it for me today. Um, I've been Ian Luckett and I look forward to catching up with you on the next podcast. Take care now. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, then please remember to subscribe, rate and review. I'd really appreciate that. And also check the show notes out for the latest developments at the IT Experts Growth Academy. If we haven't already, then let's connect on LinkedIn, YouTube and over our website at innovate2success.com. Until next time, you look after yourself and I'll catch up with you soon.